Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Church Bros Podcast. Even though this is not the Church Bros Podcast, this is, well, it's on our channel. But basically, I am starting my own individual series without Brother Brandon. He's not going to be along for the ride for this one, well, depending, but most likely not. And this series is just for the times where I'm thinking about things on my own or thinking about. Uh, wanting to do things in my own way, but also it's for the, the fact that Brandon is not always free, and so I still want to have some content, have some episodes, and some things for us to talk about here. So, I'm sure you saw the description, or not really description, but the name of the series, um, or this new, yeah, well, series that I'm coming and doing, which is Untangle, Untangling the Gordian Knot with Alex. Now, for those of you who don't know, the Gordian Knot is a legend involving Alexander the Great. And it's about, you know, well, look it up for yourself. But long story short, instead of cutting the knot like Alexander did, we're going to unfurl it, we're going to untangle it in a way, and of course this is just you know, hyperbole or, you know, we're not actually untangling knots here. You know, we're untangling the, the knots of thoughts, thought processes, the way we do things in life, stuff like that. But if you want to look up the more of the legend, I'll maybe put a link of it in the description or something like that. Maybe just whatever. But if you, you know, if you know, you know, you don't, you don't. If you don't, just look it up. I'll put a link of it in the description. All that to say, before we go any further, to like, subscribe, comment, and click on the bell so you can help us out and so you can spread the message that we are doing here. And without further ado, I'll continue with what I'm talking about. So, yes, uh, today, and the topic today, of this untangling that we're going to do is the concept of do we need fun or should we always have fun um and what i mean by that is the fact that we are a society a current society where we we think happiness and fun is all that life is supposed to be about and don't get me wrong, happiness, fun, they're great things, you know, they're they're wonderful things. But to say that that's all that life is about, I feel like that's a misconception. And not just a misconception, but something that has contributed to the deterioration and detriment of society in general as it stands today. Now, right here, I have a graph. You know, I'm sure all of you know what this is, a compare and contrast graph. And just a warning ahead of time, I'm still experimenting with these, so it's like I'm not totally, like, totally used to what these are doing here. So I'll say men up here and women right there. And of course, if I can get this correct, both, or I'll put a symbol, both. No, not really both. That's not really both, is it? Uh, do I have a symbol for this? I, I don't really have a symbol for this. I'll just say both. You know, I'm, st I'm still trying to space, 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 space. There we go. Um, I'm still trying to work out how to, oh, yes, hold on. No, we'll do that again. No, do, there we go. Yes. Now we're talking. Nope. Yes. I did not do that before, but I'm glad I can. Okay, 
so you see this graph. You see me editing it as, as we're going here. But basically, I want to compare and contrast men and women. And I also want to compare and contrast uh, fun and happiness and duty, honor, commitment, and purpose. And the reason I want to compare these things, what made me really think about this, and the knot that I'm um, presenting to us today, is the knot that is, why are divorces up? Or not even that, but why, why has, well, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll X that. Not why divorces are up, but why, what is the root cause of the reasons in which divorce is up? Or what's the root cause of the thought process? Yeah, because forget, you know, divorce is being up. That's just a, that's just a symptom. But the disease is the thought process, which is people wanting to think that life is only about fun. That's really the knot. That life is about fun, it's about being happy, and, that, and that's all, all there is. That's the knot. And I'm going to try today to debunk that knot, or to at least unfurl it, and explore it, and give a alternative thought process, or alternative solution to this problem, which is why are men and women, and sorry to say, mainly women, leaving marriages for the concept of, and yeah, for the concept that I want to have fun. Or I haven't had enough fun in my life. Or I haven't had... I'm not happy, right? Is having a divorce... Is, is unhappiness reason enough to have a divorce? Is not having fun reason enough to have a divorce? That's really one of the questions I'm going to present today. And we're going to explore it together. So first of all, this is a Christian channel, of course, or a Christian YouTube channel. So of course, I want to approach this um, I want to approach this from a Christian perspective. And I'll give my thoughts and you know thoughts and prayers and <laughs> opinions about this as we go. So first of all, men and women, I want to look at this through the Bible. And so here we are with Ephesians 5, 25, uh, yeah, ESV version for people who don't know. And basically this is really, basically this topic I'm looking at right here is duty. Because, if I'm being honest here, I can't really find, quote-unquote, fun. Uh, fun. Question mark. In the Bible. You know what? Yes. Fun. Question mark. I can't really find that in the Bible. The, the closest thing I can, you know, um, the closest thing I can find related to it is, is joy. So, joy. That's, that's the closest thing I can find to it, you know, that's, you know, does fun equal, oops, <laughs> I don't want that, oop, oop, let's see here, bye bye, okay, does fun equal joy? In relation to the Bible, right? Get out the way. 
Okay. Yeah, it's gonna, you know, my OCD is gonna kill me if I don't line this up correctly. There we go. So does fun equate to joy? And is joy, you know, is joy really... Well, we know joy is one of the fruits of the Spirit. So I'm not going to cover that today. Because in a basic sense, we all know what fun is. And in a sort of kind of basic sense, we all know what joy is. And if you don't know what joy is, go check out our podcast episode about joy. It's very fun. Well, on the other note here, let's get back on topic. So, I'm about to talk about duty. Du duty. <clears throat> if this thing will let me. Yes, there we go. Yes. Actually, that's. I didn't know I could do that. Oh, great. Duty. <laughs> and also, duty. You know, I, I'm going to get rid of that. Duty. And nope. Um, duty. Yes. There we go. Well, really... It's it, duty relates to both genders, which is why I have it right here. But actually, let me move that here. And get rid of that and this and put that there. Now, excuse my click clacking clicker, which is my, you know, mouse. I don't know if this is better, which is just slightly annoying, or me using the mouse pad here and just boop boop. I think the boopy, <laughs> the boopy, I think the boop is, is a uh, quieter, so I'm probably going to stick with the mouse pad. But yeah, let me know. I don't know where I was going with that. But anyway, you see here in our diagram that I think duty is basically something that equally that both men and women should be looking at here. But anyway, let's read the scripture. So it is Ephesians 5, 25 through 33. And actually, I'll go before that, which is 22 to 24, which is wives to husbands. I'll read that first, actually. So let's go to that. And we're actually going to stay in Ephesians for a minute here, so, you know, deal with me. It says, wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. His body and is himself its savor. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also should wives submit in everything to their husbands. Now, there are, you know, all kind of references here to this. For people who want to look at that, we'll get to that later. But basically, me and Brother Brandon have covered some of this before. But anyway, a lot of times, people just stop at this. They just stop here and really just harp on the wives to, to be, you know, submit to your husbands um, as to the Lord. But... Yeah, we'll look at what the husbands should really be doing for their wives here. So it says, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and give himself up for her that he might. So let's look at this. Well, actually, let's break this down a little bit more. 
I'm, I'm not doing the due diligence here as I should. So wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord, right? So in this sentence, we're just really talking about how... <sighs> Basically, as to the Lord, this is really the case that we would really want to look at as to the Lord. And this is kind of parallel as, as Christ loved the church here for the husbands, right? And Christ is the head of the church here. Same thing. It's a parallel of Christ loved the church. And look at this. His body and is himself its savior. And, and, you know, I'll break it down further. I'm not really doing a good job right now, but I'll, I'll loop back around at that read. So it says, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish in the same way. Husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. So, look at this. A lot of the time, this is not mentioned. This this goes back to, you know, love your neighbor as yourself kind of thing. But this also, you know, equates to one flesh, them being of one flesh, which is also mentioned here, right? He who loves his wife loves himself, right? This is also like a reflection of how you should, you know, how they should be treating each other. For no one ever hated his own flesh, right? This is talking about the one flesh. But nourishes and cherishes it just as Christ does the church. So right here, even though it's calling for wives to submit to your husband and so on and so forth, um, look at what how a husband should be treating his wife and, and the preciousness and, and the care he should be doing it in. For no one ever hated his own flesh, for, but nurtures and cherishes it just as Christ does the church. Right? So this is just not about, you know, the wives to make their husbands. It's also about, you know, how well the husband should be treating his wife. Because we are members of his body, therefore a man shall leave their father and mother and hold fast to his wife. So this is also, like, really emphasizing how much he should be supporting his wife. And to the two shall become one flesh once again. You know, becoming one flesh. You know, for no one has ever hated his own flesh, right? So this is who abuses themselves, who, you know, persecutes and, and uh, you know, uh, strikes down on their own flesh. You know, that that's insanity, right? So, same thing here. This mystery is profound, and I'm saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, however let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Now, I don't... This ESV translation is kind of... I, I like it, but it's... It's not... Whatever. We'll, we'll get back to that. But anyway, I want to focus on this overall as a text. And... Then look back at, if we look at this, right, look back at this graph. So, men, women, fun, joy, both, duty. So we really just talked about the duty of a husband and wife here. Oops, I keep doing that. We really kept talking about the duty of a husband and wife right here. In these scriptures we just covered. And, as you see, there's no mention in this text of, uh, hey, wives, you should be having a fun time. Hey, husbands, you should be having a fun time. You should be enjoying life. There, there's nothing in here that says that. Right? Nothing whatsoever, if you're looking at this from a biblical sense. Nothing in here talking about the joys of marriage or the joys of you know, how it should be, so on and so forth. Um, now, don't get me wrong, I'll be looking for that in some further text as we go along in this discussion. I'm not just going to say that it, does, it doesn't exist. 
because I'm, I'm here and learning as well. Um, I don't just want to jump ahead and say it doesn't exist, but I'm definitely looking for it as we are talking today. But I want to move on here. So we get to Ephesians you know, 6.1, talking about children, children and parents, right? So uh, I forgot to mention this earlier, but men and women includes children. Obviously, it includes grandparents, it includes children, it includes nieces and nephews, it, it includes sons and daughters and cousins and nephews and so on and so forth. I'm probably repeating myself a little bit here. But, yes, obviously, right? So, that's why I'm going back to this, to also look at this, the, the, the relationship between children and parents and how this is, you know, equated. So it says, children, obey your parents and in the Lord for this is right. Honor your father. We're talking we're gonna talk about honor later on, as I mentioned in, in the introduction. It says honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise, you know, parentheses here. This is that it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land. Fathers do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Now, I'm going to look at another ESV version and see if it just says fathers. I'm, I'm pretty sure it says um, parents do not provoke your children. But I'll double check that in a second. Uh, it did. It, does say, it says father. Interesting. So it doesn't mention the mother. Which is, we all know that mothers don't typically revoke their children. And it's mainly the fathers instilling discipline. That's funny. But yes, as fathers do not provoke your children in anger. That, that is a, that's an inter, interesting distinction here. Which we'll get to also at another time. Talking about, you know, the importance of fathers here. And then it goes into bond servants and masters. We're not going to cover this. I'm going to go to another scripture. Which is hold on, yes. First Peter. First Peter. First Peter two. What? First Peter two. Twelve. All right, so we are here at First Peter two twelve through twenty seven, I think. I'm looking at my notes correctly. Uh, twelve to twenty, actually. Mm hmm. Right. And this is basically, you know, duty as it relates to submission to authority. And actually, let me let me go back to our graph here. And let me see if I can add anything to this when it refers to men and women and the scriptures we covered earlier. So, the duty of men, well, well, Sorry right here. Oh, think on it. Oh, what did I just do? Okay, here we go. So, wives are to submit. And actually, let me bring this back up and go back to Ephesians. Ephesians 5.
oh, I, I, I went way too far. Oh man, okay. Yeah, let's see, here, let's see, let's see, I was just there, just there. Ephesians 5, 28. All right, so we see that wives are supposed to submit to their husbands, as to the Lord. And husbands will lead the wife as a church, savior, submit to Christ, submitting everything to their husbands. All right. Okay, I need to add a graph here. Because I'm missing something here that I need to incorporate. And that thing, let's see her, and that thing is our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Let me uh, do that. That's that's good enough. Let me add here. Right. No. Yes. So Jesus and God and really. I don't, well, actually, yes, there's some overlap here in both, both. Oops, uh, dang it, I keep doing that. All right, so, as we saw in the scripture here, it's talking a lot about how wives submit to their husbands. But it's also really talking about in this in relation to Christ in the church, right? Same thing here. As Christ loved the church. So it's really talking to us here about, and once again, it's right here. As Christ loved the church, right? And Christ in the church, right? So that's well that's more than three times it makes sense Christ in the church. So right here, that's two, three, four, five, I think, five times in this this section. It refers to the relationship between husband and wife as Christ's relationship to the church. And I really want to talk about that. Really want to focus on that here. So let's go back to our graph. And let's try to figure out really what's going on here. So I think given what was going on here that submit actually belongs here. Right, it belongs in that in this section where men are submitting to Christ, women are submitting to Christ. They're both submitting to each other as they should to God in relationship to the church. So that's really what I think why I think this should be here. Because if we're really looking at this overall relationship here. Um, yes. Right. Um, let's 
Let's move that up here. Right. So as we look at this, we are all called to submit to something here, right? Except for, you know, Jesus and slash God. He's not submitting to anything except for the will of the Father. Yeah, because you're just talking about Christ being the head of the church, Christ's love for the church. In church, the church submitting to Christ and the love and the care which Christ does for the church. And it even says this mystery is profound and it is saying that it refers to Christ in the church. Right? So that's to say, oops, so that's to say, that the duty of both men and women is to submit to each other as to they submit to God. So the woman submits to the man. So the duty of the woman is to submit to the man. And the duty of the man is to take care of, um, well, let me add this, care slash nurture, I can't spell for anything, so forgive me, um, I think that's the correct spelling, if it's not, I'm sure someone will tell me. Um, let, let me just double check. Stop being lazy. Uh, let me see. Let me see. Cause I'm pretty sure it was in here. Nourish. Yeah, nourish. Uh, okay, not really nurture, but pretty similar. Right. Anyway. Um, care nurture. So it's the duty of the man to care and nurture his, you know, wife as Jesus does the, ch I mean, Jesus, yeah, as D Jesus does the church. <sighs> okay, and it, <clears throat> because this is really a series of strings. So it's the woman. To the man. Let me see here. Let me let me experiment with this arrow. Uh, no, I don't. I don't. I don't need that. So men care and nurture to the woman, and the woman, you know, submits So woman, I mean, sorry, whew, woman submits, men care slash nurture, as it is one flesh. Well, 
I don't I don't need that there, but one flesh. No. I also don't need that. I need this. As this relates to marriage, at least. Not necessarily all men and all women, obviously. But in both cases, they submit to Jesus slash God. As it kind of goes in this kind of direction, as almost a triangle upward, which I have this in the wrong direction. This really should be up here, but, you know, you do what you can. So now let's go back to subjects and rulers for First Peter two. So First Peter two eleven through twenty or twelve through twenty actually. So that says, keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable. Once again, honorable, right? Which we're going to cover in a second. Hopefully before I drag this on too long. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. I'm assuming this was referring to... Hmm. Well, let's get to the submission authority part of this. So, the word of the Lord says, Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme or to governors as sent by him, to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. For, all, for this is the will of God. That by doing good, you should put to silence in the ignorance of foolish people. Live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover up for evil, but living as servants of God. Honor everyone. Love the brotherhood. Fear God. Honor the emperor. Servants, be subject to your masters with all respect, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the unjust. For this is a gracious thing. When the mindful of God, only one endures sorrow while suffering unjustly. For what credit is it if when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure? But if you, when you do good and suffer for it, you endure. This is a gracious thing in the sight of God. Hmm. And I'll keep reading here because this is, this is good. Oh, look at here. We have another thing about wives and husbands. Ooh, yes. I'm going to read that. For to this have been called, you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that the might that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. So I wanna highlight this live to righteousness, not you know, not live for fun, <laughs> not live to necessarily be happy, but live for righteousness. By his words sorry, by his wounds you have been healed, for you were state Staying like sheep, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. So, most, you know, veteran Christians know all this. Uh, I'm going to back go back and focus on all this up here. 
So love the brotherhood, fear God. Ooh, I also want to highlight this. Fear God. Um, a lot of people don't think they should fear God, even though he's the father. Even though, you know, he's the one who loves us. But I'm going to break this down a little bit more. So basically it says right here, follow the laws of the land, basically, which this is talked about in other scriptures. Follow the laws of the land. Or to the governor sent by him, you know, to punish who the evil and praise who do good, right? So, so if they're doing their jobs, right, to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. So these are the governors and the, the, the law of the land actually doing what they're supposed to do. For if they do what they're supposed to do, well, well actually, can I highlight this? Ooh, <laughs> yellow. For this is the will of God, that by doing good, you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. So, once again, highlighting, this is the will of God. So, live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover up for evil. So, not using what you have, the freedoms and liberties you have, for evil, but living as a servant of God. So, just because you can do it and are free to do it doesn't mean you should do it. But living as a servant of God, you know, hopefully we are all servants of God here, and honor everyone. So treat everyone with honor. Let's see if there's some, you know, Romans 12. Love one another. So I'm looking in the bottom corner here for people who don't know. It says, love one another with brotherly affection, undo one another in showing honor. Pray to all what is owed to them, taxes to whom taxes are owed, revenue to whom revenue is owed, respect to whom respect is owed, on to whom, I'm guessing, honor is owed. Right? There's a brotherly love. My son, fear the Lord and the king, and do not join with those who do otherwise. Right? So this is respect the laws of the land, respect the Lord, right? Fear the king. So it says, love the brotherhood. Fear God, honor the emperor. Servants be set up to your masters will all respect. So basically, respect those who have authority over you. Right? And this is, this is you know, good masters. Not only to the good, right? The good masters. And the gentle masters, but also the unjust masters. So even though your master may be unjust, unfair, unworthy, for this is the gracious thing to do, right? So that's a tough pill to swallow right here, though, even the unjust. But when, mindful of God, one endures sorrow while suffering unjustly, for what credit is it if when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure, right? So what what does it mean that you are punished for doing wrong, right? That's that's to be expected. You shouldn't do your punishment for wrongdoing. There's no necessarily glory in that, except for saying, yeah, you know, you took the beating. But if when you do good and suffer for it, you endure. This is a gracious thing in the sight of the God, right? So what, when you do the right thing and then you suffer for it, that is a gracious thing in the sight of God. And that's and this is where you want to be. It's better to do to be gracious and just and righteous in the things that we do, even if we are unjustly, you know, treated and owed by the people above us. Because we don't do it for these people, you know, for the unjust, we do it for God. But above all, fear God. Fear God Honor the emperor, honor the honor the government, honor the people above you. Because that is the duty, the duty of those of us who are Christians. That's our duty. All right, this applies to everybody. So I'm going to move on from that. Um, and go through Romans 13, 1 through 7, which I think we tried to touch on a little bit before. 
So Romans, pretty sure down here. Romans 13. Um, one through seven. So here we go. Let every person be, yeah, one through seven. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities for there is no authority except from God. I want to highlight that. All authority roots from God. And those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists the God, what God has appointed. And those who resist will incur judgment. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. So, of course, if rulers, you know, this is only, you know, if good rulers. Well, you have no fear of the one who is in authority. Do, then do what is good and you will receive his approval, right? So this is, you know, this is obvious, right? If you don't do anything wrong, more than likely, you're not going to be caught up in anything and, and incur judgment. For he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain, for he is the servant of God, and avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. Therefore, one must be in subjection, not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. So this is, this, I also want to highlight this. <laughs> subjection, not only to avoid God's wrath, to avoid God's wrath, right? For the sake of consciousness, or conscience, right? In good conscience. For the be for because of this, you also pay taxes. For the authorities are ministers of God, attending to this very thing. Pay to you all what is owed to them. Taxes to whom tax are owed. For everyone to whom everyone is owed. Respect to whom respect is owed. Honor to whom honor is owed. And I just remembered that I meant to read that you know section about husbands and wives in First Peter. So I'm going to go back to that. Um, first Peter two. Yes, which goes actually to first Peter three. So, um, this is, you know, also talks about wives and husbands and the, and the dues and responsibilities henceforth. So I was all, I was looking for some more stuff and here we are. It says, likewise, wives, be subject to your husbands, so that even if some do not obey the word, they may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives when they see your respectful and pure conduct. So I want to I wanna highlight this right here. <laughs> respectful and pure conduct. So let's, let me be clear here. You're not going to win um, you're not going to win without a word unless you have respectful and pure conduct. So, you know, spiritual blackmail, you know, blackballing, brown beating or brow beating, not really brown beating, I guess. <laughs> I don't know what that even is. But basically, hitting someone over the head with a scripture and saying they're wrong all the time, doing this and that, that's not going to necessarily work here. But respectful and pure conduct. Make them feel, make them look stupid by your respectful and pure conduct. And then hopefully their shame will be enough to really win without a word. So I want to highlight this as things a wife should be. Respectful and pure conduct, which we are highly missing in, in society as we have it today. So I'm going to continue. Do not let your adorning be external. Oh my goodness. Yes, sir. Do not let your adorning be external. The braiding of your hair and the putting of gold jewelry or the clothing you wear. But let your adorning be the hidden person, the hidden person of your heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit. 
So let me reemphasize this. Do not let your outside appearance be all that is qualifying you as a woman. Being all that qualifies you as something to honor. Right? That your outside appearance is all that you have to get a man or to have your man respect you. Because this is a part of the thing I'm talking about, or a part of the reason that we are having a lot of issues in, in marriage and relationships today. Because emphasis is put highly on outside appearance, the superficial. And this right here is telling us why this is not working. Okay, so but the alternative is, but let your adorning be the hidden person. See, is not, but don't let your adorning, like your adorning is not your appearance or your outside appearance. It's the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit. So these are two things, right? Respectful and pure conduct. And then a gentle and quiet spirit. Are we seeing this here? You know, do I do I have to <laughs> do I have to underline it or something? But yes, I want to I want to emphasize these two things, which in the sight God's sight is a very precious, which is very precious. So in God's sight, this is precious. You don't, you don't have to do this for a man. Do this for God. For this is how the holy woman who poked in God used to adorn themselves by submitting to their own husbands as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, and you are her children. If you do good and do not fear anything, that is frightening. So this... Is really something that I find very important to the current issue of, you know, what is important in life. And this right here is telling you what is important to God, which ultimately means what is important in life. Right here. And there are also some other scriptures that talk about this. And um, I'm pretty sure it's... Well, some of this is touched on in James. But also some of this is touched on... Where's the other places it's touched on? I'll get back to that. So anyway, we'll keep talking about the husband side of this. So it says, likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way. So men are to be understanding. Showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. So, I want to emphasize this. Showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel, which I think a lot of men do, but in the wrong way. Since they are heirs with you of the grace of life, so that your prayers might not be hindered, right? So, this is also a reason where men's prayers are hindered, which I think I might have covered with Brandon in one of our episodes. I'm pretty sure we did cover this. Right, so I'm just going to skip you that real fast. But yeah, that's not the focus. Well, this is related to what we were talking about, but I'm not going to I'm not going to focus on this right now. This is also something I want to talk about as well. Um, but yeah, suffering for righteousness' sake is also kind of related to what we're talking about uh, in terms of is fun really necessary for this life, or is it something that God cares that you have or not? And I think the answer is no, um, from what I'm seeing so far. So we already covered Romans 13, 1 through 7. So we're going to go to 1 Peter 3, 8 through 16. Um, which I think... Oh, it's actually this. <laughs> well, that's that's hilarious. Well, like I said, we, we are in the right thing. That's, that's funny. 
So, I'll, I guess I'll read it. Um, finally, all of you have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, and a humble mind. Do not repay evil for few, evil or re reveling for reveling, but on the contrary, bless for this you were called, that you may obtain a blessing for whoever desires to love life and see good days. Let him keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Now, who is there to harm you if you are zealous for what is good? Now, I want to I wanna emphasize this. I think a lot of people forget this. Now, who is there to harm you if you are zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness snake, which we covered a little while ago, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled. But in your heart, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason you the hope that it is in you. Yet do not with gentleness and respect. Sorry, I read that totally wrong. To make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you, yet do it with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will, than for doing evil. So, once again, this is kind of emphasizing my point that we are not, <laughs> for it's better to suffer for doing good if that should be God's will than for doing evil. So it's like, once again, if you're having, quote unquote, fun, in the, well, the wrong kinds of fun is what I would say, then once again, I'm, it's kind of proving my point that this, that it's, it's better for us to suffer and do good than for us to enjoy life in the wrong ways. And that covers duty, really. Um, and of course we've read the parts of emphasizing, you know, the relationship between men and women. And I'll actually add um, respectful conduct, respectful and pure conduct. Let me see if I can copy paste this without this turning into an issue. Oh no. <laughs> yes, that was an issue. Uh, it's actually me to put in a note. I don't want to put in any notes. I want to copy paste. Um, let's see if I can do that. Let me see if that actually does anything on here. <sighs> okay. Nope. All right, respect. Respectful. Pure conduct. Yes, right here, slash, dupe, do, uh, no, this, no, there we go. A respectful and pure conduct will actually, let me see if I can enter, there we go. I think you think I will learn by this point. You think I will learn? Obviously not. Okay. Where am I? 
Yes, here. Respectful repair conduct and where are we at? Where are we at? Where are we are. So really the heart is also a highlight here. The heart and with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit. <laughs> so gentle and quiet spirit. It's really the other thing we want to look at here. Gentle slash here. I'm going to do that every single time, aren't I? And I think for Mend, it, it was understanding. Let me see if I missed anything else with that. I think honor would be a great thing to add here. Yes. Yes. So Care, care and nurture, understanding, honor, all towards the woman. As the woman submits, respectful and pure conduct, gentle and quiet spirit. And the, both of them are, these are duties of being of one flesh as they submit to God. <sighs> um, I hope that is clear um, for the audience. As I move on to our next section, which is honor. So, yeah, let's go. Let's look at honor. <laughs> Let me see here. Honor, honor, honor. I am currently looking through my notes, so give me a second here. I lost my place in my notes, which is slightly embarrassing. <laughs> um, okay, I'm not even in the right section anymore. I think the correct answer to that is no. Oh, here we are. I found it. So honor is very extensive. It, it's there are some references in you know honor in terms of God, Christ's parents, the aged, and church officers. Then we have honor in, in terms of wisdom or obtainable by wisdom, graciousness, discipline, humility, peaceableness, righteousness, and mercy. Honoring God and serving Christ. So these are all different ways you can obtain honor in terms of biblically. And I don't really know what to focus on here. Um, I I guess I'll just start and just go down the line. So let's let's visit First Timothy. Let's uh, let's First Timothy. Let's see. One through seventeen. Oh no, wait. No, just no. First Timothy one seventeen. Let's see. So it says, To the king of the ages, immortal, invisible, 
the only God. Be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Oh, basically he's just saying God is worthy of honor, which is hopefully very obvious to anyone who's listening currently. Um, yeah, and these are <laughs> reasons he should be honored. So I'll, I'll move on. This is just a, a prayer, a, a hymn um, from of Timothy to God. So Christ, well, let's go to John 5.23. Let's see here. John five twenty-three. And these are the words of Jesus, as you see in red. That all may honor the Son, just as they honor the Father. Whoever does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. He says, truly, truly, I say to you, and Allah is coming and is now here when. Uh, hold on, I'm going to stop reading for a second because I want to see if this is going to repeat later on. Um, no, it is not later on in my notes, so I'll keep reading here. Because it also mentions honor further through this. So it says, truly, truly, I say to you at verse 25, an honor is coming and is now here when the dead will hear the voices of, of the Son of God and who here will live. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has extended the Son also to his life in himself. He has given him authority to execute judgment. So I, I want to emphasize here, right here. So Jesus also, you know, is given Authority to execute judgment, because he is the son of man. Do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come out, and those who have done good to the resurrection of life, and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. So this is, you know, also another warning to not just unbelievers, but for, for us who proclaim to be believers, that we have to be careful about you know, how we conduct ourselves here. So basically, this is also saying, you know, Jesus is worthy of honor. This is Jesus proclaiming that he is worthy of honor. Which I hope should be obvious to anybody. Um, so next is Ephesians 6, 2, which I think we already covered. Which is talking about the honor of parents. So I'm not going to go there because we are all familiar with that, and I just read it earlier. Um, actually, let me double check if that's the exact same verse. I think it is, but it's always good to check. I'm pretty sure it is. Did I go to the right one? I get to the right verses. Two. Oh, yeah, here we are. I did not get to the right verses. But yes, this is, yeah, same thing I read earlier. I was pretty sure that was the case. So this is the honor of parents, which I'm not going to repeat. Um... But I am going to go to 1 Timothy 5, 1 and 3. It says, do not rebuke an older man, but encourage him as you would a father. Oh, hmm. Younger men as brothers, older women as mothers, younger women as sisters, in all purity. Honor widows who are truly widows. Mm. If a widow has children or grandchildren, let them first learn to show godliness to their own household and to make 
some return to their parents, for this is pleasing in the sight of God. So honor the widows and honor the ones who are, you know, the older generation, honor people in general, basically. Next is uh, church officers, which is Philippians 2, 25 and 29. Yes. Here we go. He says, I have thought it necessary to send to you I'm not even going to read that name. My brother and fellow worker and fellow soldier and your messenger and ministers to your, my need. How does this relate to honor? I think that's the right place. That being 225. Yes. Mm. Let's go to 29. So receive him in the Lord with all joy and honor, such men, for they nearly died. I was interrupted there, and I had to pause the recording um, because my power blinked out for a second there. But I think I was at um, verse 29. So it says, So receive him in the Lord with all joy and honor, such men, for he nearly died for the work of Christ, risking his life to complete that was what was lacking in your service to me. Well, if that is not a sentence, I don't know what is. So let's revisit this this graph here. And let's let's you know let's put honor. Exclamation point point point. Here, Ooh. no, yes, here, for how we conduct ourselves to Christ and to each other and, and to the Lord, which is also worthy of honor. So submit and honor. Um, I want to emphasize these. These are things that are not mentioned in our <laughs> pursuit of fun. You know, I'll I'll get to joy in a second after I get, after I go through all this. But yes, it's from this we can see what God really wants us to do with our lives here, and it, it doesn't entail fun so far. And like I said, those of us, I mean, those of you who haven't seen it, go look at our episode pertaining to joy. Um, even though I'll brush over it at the end of this, I think it's worth looking at that episode. And if I, you know, I pause for a second or two, that's because I'm thinking um, and looking at my notes. So, <laughs> sorry about that. So here we are, here we are, here we are. And that was how we should treat church officers in pertaining to honor. Um, and let's look at what is honorable. Or how you, you know, um, gain honor. I'll actually start with serving Christ was at the bottom of the list with John 12 26 so let's go there John 12 26 so it says if anyone serves me he must follow me and where I am, there will be servant, my servant, 
What? Okay. Let me read that again. Where I am, there will my servant be also. If anyone serves me, the honor, the Father will honor him. All right. So that's how you one version of gaining honor is serving the Lord Jesus Christ. And also, you know, this is the calling of, you know, all of us in the New Testament. Let's look at honoring God with 1 Samuel 2.30. It says, therefore, the Lord, the God of Israel, declares, I promise that your house and the house of your father should go in and out before me forever. But now the Lord declares, far be it from me, for those who honor me, I will honor. And those who despise me shall be lightly esteemed. Behold, the days are coming when I will cut off your strength and the strength of your father's house, so that there will not be an old man in your house. So, okay, this is why <laughs> God deserves honor. And this is also why we should be careful in which, you know, we proclaim the words out of our mouths and the, and, the, and the conduct in which we um, carry ourselves in relation to how we really should be honoring God. So now I'm going to go to Proverbs, which covers all kinds of reasons why you would gain honor. Proverbs, the book of wisdom. And we are going to Proverbs 3.16. Here we are. I'm going to back up a little bit here. So, blessed is the one who finds wisdom. Blessed is the one who finds wisdom and the one who gets understanding. For the gain from her is better than the gain from silver, and her profit better than gold. She is more precious than jewels, and nothing you desire can compare with her. Long life is in her right hand, and in her left hand, riches and honor. Her ways are ways of pleasantness, and all her paths are peace. She is the tree of life to those who lay hold of her. Those who hold her fast are called blessed. And this is wisdom. So Proverbs eleven sixteen. You know, I'll, I'll see if I can actually get there faster by just going like this. Let's see. Yep. Eight. Nine. Well, actually, the other way probably would have been faster. All right, so eleven sixteen. So it it says, a gracious woman gets honor, and violent men get riches. A man who is kind benefits himself, but a cruel man hurts himself. I'm going to back up a little bit here. So this is also, okay, I'm going to read this because I think this also relates to our topic overall. So it says, a false balance is an abomination of the Lord, but a just weight is his delight. When pride comes, then comes disgrace, but with the humble is wisdom. The integrity of the upright guides them, but the Crookedness of the treacherous destroy them. Riches do not profit in the day of wrath, but righteous delivers from death. The righteous of the blameless keeps his way straight, but the wicked falls by his own wickedness. The righteous of the upright delivers them, but the treacherous, treacherous, treacherous are taken captive by their lust. When the wicked dies, his hope will, will perish, and the expected of wealth perishes too. 
are the expectation of what perishes do. The righteous is delivered from trouble, but the wicked walks into it instead. With his mouth, the godless man will destroy his neighbor, but by knowledge the righteous are delivered. When it goes well with the righteous, the city rejoices, and when the wicked perishes, perish, there are shouts of gladness. By the blessing of the upright, a city is exalted, but by the mouth of the wicked, it is overthrown. I think this also can apply to modern politics. Whoever belittles his neighbor lacks sense. This will also apply to modern politics. But a man understanding remains silent. But a man of understanding remains silent. Whoever goes about slandering, yeah, I think this also can apply to modern politics, and to, to, to the gender wars that are going on between men and women. Whoever goes about slandering reveals secrets. But he who is trustworthy as a spirit and spirit keeps a thing covered. Where there is no guidance, a people falls. I think this is where we also find a lot of young people today. But in abundance of counselors, there is safety. Yeah, I think this is something we need today. Whoever puts up security for a stranger will surely suffer harm. But he who hates striking hands and pledges is secure. So a gracious woman gets honor. I think this is something that, let me see, yeah, copy, my goodness, I could have just did that earlier. Oh, my goodness, sad days, oh, oh no, here we go. So I think all attributes that should be <laughs> talk, I mean, looked at here, you know, all attributes that should be looked at here. Um, right. So enough of that. Let's go and read some more Proverbs in Discipline, which is Proverbs 13, 18, which is not that far away. Let's go here, 13, 18. Poverty and disgrace come to him who ignores instruction, but whoever needs reproof is honored. <laughs> I know a certain fella who might need to hear this one. <laughs> I'll let you guys guess who that is. Um, Alright, this is discipline. Actually, I'm going to send that to this individual right now. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. And key, give me a second, everybody, while I send this. Here we go. All right, now that that's taken care of, <laughs> so I don't forget to do it. Uh, we're going to Proverbs fifteen thirty three. Which is also not far away, so let's just scroll down. Um, the fear of the Lord is in instruction and wisdom, and humility comes before honor. So once again, the fear of the Lord here. I want to I emphasize this once again. Because I think a lot of people don't understand the fear of the Lord. And think that... God is just all love. Obviously not, because you should fear him. I mean, love is just a part of it. And humility comes before honor. So, be, you know, be humble, guys. Be humble. That's really what we should be at the end of the day. This is one of the key tenets of Christianity, humility. And it should be our one of our main focuses here as Christians in our walk in faith. Um, so Proverbs 23, peace, 
peaceableness. Peaceableness. It's a tongue twister there. And that's Proverbs 23. It is an honor for a man to keep aloof from strife, but every fool will be quarreling. I think that is self-explanatory, um, as Proverbs tend to be. So yeah, I will not. <laughs> um, hold on, that person responded to me, and they think that that's what I'm teaching on. Um, yes, but yeah, this is, this is self-explanatory in a certain degree. Um, sorry, I'm getting distracted here. Alright, so, sorry about that. Um, had to address that real fast. But yeah, that's peaceableness. So, righteousness and mercy, Proverbs 21, 21. Whoever pursues righteousness and kindness will find life, righteousness, and honor. A wise man scales the city of mighty and brings down the stronghold in which they trust. Um. Yeah, I think once again, self-explanatory as proverbs tend to be. Um, kindness will find life, righteousness, and honor. So yeah, um, that's pretty much everything pertaining to honor that I have. Um, but I am not done. We are now going to look at... Let me see here. Let me look at my notes again. All right, we can now touch on purpose from my notes here. Now, I'm not totally sure what, cause, all right, there's two basically purposes, purposes of God and purposes of man. I really want to focus on the purposes of man, even though the purposes of God are very interesting. But yeah, I'll, I'll get to the purposes of man first, and we'll we'll touch on the purposes of God at a, at a different time, because you know, that is kind of a different message. Um, so, the purpose of good men. Now, first, I'll, I'll touch on the purpose of evil men, and that is Jeremiah forty nine and thirty. So let's let's visit that real fast. Jeremiah 49, 30. Okay. So, flee, wonder, Far away, dwell in the depths, O inhabitants of Hazor, declares the Lord. For Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, has made a plan against you and formed a purpose against you. Hmm. I'm going to go to a different verse because that's just, you know, 
what is known by God, right? God knows the intentions of evil men. Um, so this is the Zion against the righteous. So this is Psalms 140, 144. So now 144, but 140, verse 4. So chapter 140, verse 4. So, Psalms, where you at? Here we go. Psalms is like the most extensive book ever. It's endless. So it says, Guard me, O Lord, from the hands of the wicked. Preserve me from violent men who have planned to trip up my feet. The arrogant have tripped, or have hidden a trap for me. And with course they have spread a net besides the way they have set snares for me, say la. Okay, so that is what evil men do against the righteous. Um and this is how evil men hinder the righteous or hinder you know, believers, which is Daniel 6. Um, let's see here. Where are you, Daniel? Daniel 6. Um, seventeen to twenty three. So seventeen. It says, and a stone was brought and laid on the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own singent and with the singent of his lords, that nothing might be char changed concerning Daniel. Then the king went to his palace and spent the night fasting. No diversions were brought to him and slept, fled from him. Let me see here. How far am I supposed to read? Twenty-three. All right. Then a break of then at break of the of day, the king arose and went in haste to the den of lions. As he came near to the den where Daniel was, he cried out in a tone of anguish. The king declared to Daniel, "O Daniel, servant of the living God." Has your God, whom you serve continually, been able to deliver you from the lions? Then Daniel said to the king, O king, live forever. My God sent his angel and shut the lions' mouths. And they have not harmed me, because I have found blameless before him, and also before you, O king, I have done no harm. Then the king was exceedingly glad and commanded that Daniel be taken out of the den, so that Daniel was taken up out of the den, and no kind of harm was found on him, because he had trusted in his God. And the king commanded, so, so this is Daniel being hindered by evil men. So basically the advisors of the king, who had decided to hinder the good things of Daniel, basically tried to kill him. And we all know pretty much the, how that story went. All right, so let's look at the positive side of this, which is the purposes of good men. Um, so just as a recap, evil men are known by God, are designed against the righteous, and will try to hinder the righteous, um, hinder the servants of the Lord. So good men are hindered by evil men, which is Ezra 4, 5. I'm pretty sure you're down here, Ezra. That's too far. Or is it Ezekiel? It's hard to tell sometimes. No, it's Ezra. Which people never look at. I, I don't know how many times I've been to Ezra as a book. It's not many. And that's not from a lack of interest. It's just because people don't go here as often. Oh, okay, Ezra 4, 5. Where are we at here? And it's right here. 
and bribed counselors against them to frustrate their purpose all the days of Cyrus, king of Persia, even until the reigns of Darius, king of Persia. Right. And that is hindered by evil men. Yeah, okay, I see that. Yeah, adversary is opposed to rebuilding. I'm guessing this is the rebuilding of a temple. Okay, so this is the, okay. All right, so the people of the land, yeah, discouraging, okay, I see. So good men are known by others in Second Timothy 3.10. So let's go to that. You, however, have followed my teachings, my conduct, my aim in life, my faith, my patience, my love, and my steadfastness. And this is all scriptures be able to God. Mm. My persecutions, persecutions and sufferings have happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium, and at Lystra. 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 I think it's Lystra, actually. So this is the purpose of good men. Am I in the right section? Second Timothy three ten. Hmm. With persecutions I endured yet from them all the Lord secured me. Where is Where is purpose here? Oh, my aim in life. That's purpose. My conduct, my aim in life, my faith, my patience, my love, my steadfastness. Whoever have followed my teaching. Okay. I see, I see, I see. Then it says, unknown to the wise is I... Oh, that's, right. that's the purpose of God. <laughs> So permitted is Daniel 1, 8 through 16. But Daniel resolved that he would not defile himself with the king's food or with the wine that he drank. Therefore, he asked the chief of the um, eunuchs to allow him not to defile himself. And God gave Daniel favor and compassion in the sight of the chief of the eunuchs. And the chief of the eunuchs said to Daniel, I fear my lord the king who signed your food and your drink. For why should he set, see that you were in worse condition than the youths who are of your own age? So you wouldn't endure my head with the king. The nail said to the steward, when the chief of the eunuchs had assigned over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, test your servants for ten days, let us be given vegetables to eat and water to drink, then let our appearances, appearance and the appearance of the youth who eat the kings who will be observed by you, and deal with your servants according to what you see. So he listened to them in this manner and tested them for ten days. At the end of the ten days, it was seen that they were better in appearance and fatter in flesh than all the youths who ate the king's food. So the steward took away their food and the wine they were drinking and gave them vegetables. As for the four, these four youths, God gave them learning and skill in all literature and wisdom, and Daniel had 
understanding in all visions and dreams. Hmm. Before Nebuchadnezzar. So basically when good men are permitted. Okay, nice. Accomplished. First Kings 5.5. Five. In a sense, and so I intended to build a house for the name of the Lord my God, as the Lord said to David my father, your son, whom I will set on your throne in your place, shall build the house of my name, or for my name. Okay. Um, oh, okay, so that's the purpose of men are accomplished. Okay. Okay. So determine, so that's Psalms seventeen three. You have tried my heart and you have visited me by night. You have tested me and you will find nothing. I have purpose that my mouth will not transgress. All right, so determine a purpose <laughs> that my mouth will not transgress, okay? With regard to the works of man, by the word of your lips, I have avoided the ways of violent. My steps have held fast to your paths. My feet have not slipped. Okay. So, in the shadow of the wings, a prayer of King David to God. Then you got some good prayers. I'm sorry, David has some good prayers. <laughs> I was looking at Daniel a little while ago, so you know, forty and slip. Okay. So delayed X nineteen twenty one. It says, now after these events, Paul resolved on the site to pass through Macedonia and Achaia and go to Jerusalem saying, after I've been there, I must also see Rome. So the right of Ephesus is the topic. Delayed. Oh, so he's delayed. So, Okay. The purpose of man is delayed. Okay, I get it. So Second Chronicles one seventeen, let's look at that. Hmm. 
They imported a chariot from Egypt for 600 shekels of silver and a horse for 150. Likewise, though, through them, these were exported to all the kings of the Hittites and the kings of Syria. So not facilitating, okay? Hmm. Well, anyway, all that to say, through all these little, you know, readings of purpose, seems the overall theme here. It's still facilitated through God. So purpose is still facilitated through God. Whether it's known by God of evil men's intentions, whether it's hindered by evil men, whether well, it's known by others or permitted or accomplished or determined or delayed, all of it is in relation to the auspice of God. That's where men and women, and of course, like I said, it's a, this falls into under God. Um, let's look at joy. Let's finally look at joy. Let's let's come to a conclusion here. Um, uh, let's let me turn these pages. Where are you, Joey? Where are you? Here we go, Joy. Joy is actually very extensive. Maybe me and Brandon need to revisit it. So, Joy, the gladness of the heart. So I'll just cover these, like summarize these sections here. I'm not going to go to, I might read some of them. I'll, I'll loop back around. I'm just going to read these, all, all these different sections. So joy is defined as the gladness of the heart. And there are kinds of joy, which include foolishness, temporary, motherly, figurative, and future, which are all things me and Brandon covered in our podcast episode about joy. Um, so it's described as everlasting, great, full, abundant, and unspeakable. Um, the causes of joy are victory, Christ's birth, Christ's resurrection, sinners' repentance, miracles among the Gentiles, forgiveness, God's word, spiritual discovery, names written in heaven, and true faith. Um, the peace and joy is found through prayer, um, Christian prayer, fellowship, tribulation, or sorry, Christian fellowship, tribulation, and giving. And it's contrasted with weeping, tears, sorrows, and mourning, um, pain and loss, adversity, discipline, persecution. Um, the angels of joy are at creation, at Christ's birth, and at sinner's conversion. And expressed by, joy is expressed by songs, musical instruments, sounds, praises, shouting in, in the heart. As seen in Galatians, or seen in gladness as happiness of the, of the saints. So, I 
where I want to go with this. First of all, I'm going to go to Proverbs 15 and 21. Let's look at the foolish joy. Because I think this, this really applies to the topic of the day. So it says, Folly is a joy to him who lacks sense, but a man of understanding walks straight ahead. All right. And this is really the key of what I'm talking about here. So folly is a joy to him who lacks sense. So I think a lot of what we're seeing in today's um, relationship between men and women and happiness and marriage and fun is folly <laughs> and the lack of sense. Um, basically abandoning relationships strictly for um, for this. For folly, just for your own selfish, you know, fulfillment. But even then, like, joy is not, I wouldn't equate, equate joy to fun or joy to, you know, what it is a lot of these people are defining as why they're leaving relationships. Um, I don't know if I could come to a full conclusion here. Um, well, the conclusion I want to come to is the fact, well, yes, well, what I'm really thinking here is that I want to conclude with the fact that, so I'm, I've, I've split minds on this. I'm going to have another episode on this. I'm going to revisit the joy aspect of this, but I'll, I'll leave this episode with this in conclusion. In conclusion, I want to say that joy and fun are not the same. So this gets a big, you know, if if I will get a chance to do so, blah. This gets a big, you know, slash through it. Fun and joy are not the same. Now, fun can bring you joy. Um, but I will not say fun is equating to the joy that is the fruit of the spirit. And I will also say that men and women have lost sight of these things that I have, you know, put in this section below. And I'll revisit, you know, the honor of God's honor and God's purpose and so on and so forth as it relates to the Bible. But really, I wanted to focus on this because this is really what is destroying relationships and the way people look at things today. I, I, and I'll say this is, is missing. This... This, um, this relationship is missing. And if this will stop doing that, go around. Go around. Why won't you go around? There we go. There we go. Well, you there. No, there, 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 
there. There. I don't know why it's doing that. I move you. What? Anyway, same thing here. The relationship between be gone. The relationship between men and God. So basically, men and women's relationship to God and Jesus. And them honoring all this, you know, which encompasses everything to honor, to love God. So, so love... and fear... of God so this love and fear which is in some of the scriptures we're talking about today so if you love and fear the Lord in Jesus Christ well, really, God and, you know, love and honor Jesus Christ, you would do these things. So all these are a product of the love and fear of God. And in doing so, the love and the care and the honor in which we give Jesus Christ. Right? Right? In relation to his sacrifice, you do these things because it's a duty and it is your submission and honor and purpose to do so. But when we get caught up in this fun, we forgo all this because fun is not joy in relation to Biblical principles. So I'll conclude with that. And if um, there are any opinions or things you want me to add for, to this graph and, you know, talk about in relation to this graph. I, I wanted to dive deeper into this subject. We're not with, we're not done with this. I might edit some of my uh, thoughts on this and revisit this very soon. But this is just a preliminary surface thoughts, surface research on this topic. And I really want you guys to, to send me some, some things to further look into because I'm really just brainstorming here about this. I'm really just, you know, looking into this as we go along, um, I want to <laughs> untangle the knots of this thought of these of these things, and I want to go do this on a journey with you guys. So, without further ado, I'll leave it here. So, thank you for joining me. I hope you enjoyed this format. I hope you enjoyed this journey of discussion together with me. Um, and like, subscribe, hit the bell all those things, and I'll see you next time on, <laughs> I don't know, <laughs> I'll see you next time on this, because I, I, I keep tongue tying the, the title, but basically, um, on Untangle the Knot, Untangle the Gordian Knot with Alex, I'll see you next time, thank you.